it's okay to not have it all together all the time. On this episode of Women Who Hustle, we sit down with one of Africa's most powerful voices, Arid Okpo. Her love for the African narrative has opened opportunities for others to share their stories. For those who might not know who you are, you know, just give us a little bit of background. First, my name is Arid. I am a um... When, whenever I'm asked to introduce myself, I always start like this. Um, with a TV, TV host, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm a voiceover talent. Um, I actually moved to, I, I started the process of moving to Nairobi just a couple of years ago, um, partly because I was excited about exploring the world outside of um, my very Nigeria-centric experience. And I, I think I'm still very attached to the continent. So I like the idea of being here. And um, Nairobi coincided very beautifully with then starting work at African Voices. And so it seemed like the perfect opportunity, given the flexibility I have, to right. be able to um, make my home here. Tell us a bit of about your background in terms of, you know, how you got to be in, in, in journalism. And, um, you know, maybe for some young girl out there who's listening and who's inspired by a story, you know, who might want to follow the same path as you. I think that my biggest lessons about my journey have been in the entire unexpectedness of it. Right. Um, I studied biochemistry. Wow. And um, yes, <laughs> I studied biochemistry and, um, when I graduated, I wasn't really sure that this was how I would want to proceed, but I went ahead and registered for my master's anyway. And then mm -hmm. while I was waiting for admission, uh, my friend's mom calls me and she says, you've got a few months before you go back to school. Um, a friend of mine is opening a school. Uh, so why don't you just come as sister while you wait for your admission? So I, I started uh, working at the school and then found out that I loved school administration. I loved education. I have several people in my family who work in education. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, you know what, we're going to put this master's on hold for now because, you know, I wasn't really sure at first. And I'm really enjoying this. Right. Uh, a couple of years after that, I went for a reality show. Uh, and it was a debate reality show. Now, I didn't win. Mm -hmm. But the competitive producer remembered me. And so three years later, when she was starting uh, her news channel, uh, her TV channel, Ebony Life TV, um, mm -hmm. Moab, and, and she called me and said, you know, I want to start a new show. And I feel very strongly that you would be perfect for it. And this was in 2013. I was at that point, you know, where you feel like I have the opportunity to take several directions right now. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like such a fit you know, for me. So I said, yes. And I moved cities and started working in television. Um, and when I got there, she essentially said to me, so we're creating a, a, a news show based on good news. You have three months to prepare your content and get ready. And uh, wow. I wish you the best. Wow. <laughs> but it's a powerful opportunity to learn <laughs> on the job, practical right. learning about mm -hmm. how to make television and how to be in television. And so fast forward a couple more years, I leave Ebony Life TV, I'm working freelance. And then I get, uh, somebody calls me to do a voiceover. Mm -hmm. So I do the voiceover, it's wonderful. And then a couple of months later, he says to me, somebody I know is auditioning for a host for CNN African Voices, for a voiceover person for CNN African Voices. Would you be interested in auditioning? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So they send me a script and I record it and send it back. And that's how I start doing the voice work for CNN African Voices. And then a year later, being officially announced as the host. So I think for me, the biggest lesson, uh, the, the two big lessons that I, I carry with me, and that's that many times, um, I think we can start 
life starts a certain way right. and it can be difficult to see what a shift looks like. Mm-hmm. You know, but mm-hmm. it was always much good in identifying that even though the shift didn't look conventional, it fitted where I was mm-hmm. and where mm-hmm. I hoped to go. Mm-hmm. You know, and learning that helped me to see that my talents can travel. They're not just restricted to an industry. Right. So that's what I ended right. up here. What would it be that 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 excites you? about being part of African change makers? I love the fact that many times we tell the stories of people who are not looking to be famous. They're just doing their thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But they have the kind of journeys and they do the kind of work that deserves to be amplified. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, what you have is a range of stories of different kinds that tells you that no matter what you do, you can make a difference wherever you are. And so one week you might be talking about a sports star who's going back to his community to elevate the lives of of children there. And another week we might be talking about a woman who learned to make pastries and now is providing opportunities for other people. Another day we might be talking about a surfer, a female surfer, who is setting her dreams um, on the Olympics, or we talk about a diver who's trying to bring diversity into diving. Um, Many of these people are just doing their bit and Mm -hmm. in doing their bit, making a difference. They don't want to be famous. They don't Mm -hmm. want to, you know, be splashed on on newspapers and and, uh, all of that. Mm -hmm. But they are, the, they are the stories that deserve to be told. And every time we get to tell one of those stories, I feel such a profound gratitude. How many more stories there are that I don't know. It's okay to not have it all together all the time. In a continent such as Africa, you know, where certain topics are seen as taboo, you know, how do you manage to strike the balance between fair and honest reporting? One of the most um, important things for me um, with African Voices, with the documentaries, is that my stories are ultimately about people. I think that many times we focus on the cultural and social expectations and limitations mm-hmm. around stories, and those are very valid. Um, it's important to pay attention to things like that. But when you are telling the story of someone whose voice deserves to be heard, and you are able to tell that story in a way that presents them, there will be pushback. There'll always be pushback when you challenge tradition or challenge, you know, um, ways of being, challenge or systems. Ultimately, the the root of any story is the person whose story is being told and the people for whom that story has impact. And when you let that frame the way you tell your stories, um, for me, that is always my Mm. primary guide. story that I tell, Mm -hmm. for every one story I'm familiar with, Mm -hmm. there are hundreds of other stories that may seem similar, but are also individual. Right. And there's a trap in thinking that you are the only one who can tell stories and that Mm -hmm. you are the only one who knows which stories are, are relevant and you are the only one. There's a bit of a trap there that I'm very aware of. And Doing the work that I do on a platform like CNN has challenged me to be humble Mm. and to recognize how many more stories there are that I don't know. 
how many more perspectives there are that I'm unaware of, how many contexts there are that I need to learn about. So I have become a student asking mm. myself, what is the thing in this story that I didn't know before? And it's yeah. my love passion to continue to engage with African stories, with curiosity, with humanness, with nuance, mm. um, and to learn. It's okay to not have it all together all the time. Because there's right. so much pressure, you know. I turn 40 next year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 25. I'm mm -hmm. not 30. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm not joking. It's literally felt like in the last year or two where my vision is coming together. Mm -hmm. And I've needed all these mistakes and all these learning moments and all these curveballs to get me to this clarity of vision that mm -hmm. is developing. And we have right. women in their early 20s, mid 20s, dealing with society, dealing with cultural expectations and feeling like they have to have all the answers. Mm -hmm. For me, the learning is the journey, mm -hmm. you know, the unlearning, the discovering of yourself and understanding what your purpose Right. For, your, for your community and, and for the rest of your life is that is the journey right and i'm very committed to being able to say look everything i learned i learned what i don't know is either not my business or it's in the future for me to learn because you know we say we're not none of us is free until all of us are free i am passionate about everybody who takes ownership of their story. How has uh, COVID and the pandemic changed your storytelling, if at all? COVID did an unexpected thing, or COVID amplified something that's happening in storytelling, which is mm -hmm. that many people are taking ownership of their stories. Wow. And I think that COVID on the African, and even on the larger African scale, um, Around the time COVID was happening, there were so many stories being told. And I saw African storytellers, African journalists, um, African doctors taking ownership and saying, there's a way that COVID stories are being told on the continent that isn't capturing the nuance, isn't capturing our work, isn't capturing our resilience and our victories. And so we're gonna tell our stories our way. stories. We're providing a platform so that people who have stories can tell them. I think that the way social media evolved, um, look at us sitting here. We're doing this conversation. Um, it's an online, we're having this deeply impactful conversation. Yeah. It's stripped away a lot of the fuss and a lot of the fluff. Right. And it's brought so many stories closer, you know. I, I feel personally for me that storytelling on the continent has become more connected. People no longer need to find a general context with which to, in which to fit their stories. Mm -hmm. The stories are valid as is, and it's now everybody else's responsibility to learn. Storytelling has changed completely. conversation for me, no, I wouldn't say it's the biggest, but a very important conversation for me is how can we make equality a structural conversation? Mm. How can we protect the rights of women 
at a structural policy level. If a woman is sexually assaulted, can she go to the police and be assured of a sensitive police officer who will take her case on and not ask her what she was wearing? Mm. You know, can, can, we, can we create equality as, uh, so that women can go to a bank and access a loan, so that women can take um, reproductive health decisions that don't require an abusive husband's consent? Um, how can we make equality structural? Because, you know, we say we're not, none of us is free until all of us are free. When we tell those stories about women who are success, uh, successful or succeeding in certain spaces, I'm motivated by what it means for the women in their community. Right. For the women that they encounter. Um, when I hear about women overcoming odds to you know, get this achievement or hit this milestone, I am reminded that there are other women who will look at this woman and think this thing is possible. Mm. And so that for me is a very important beacon of, mm. of hope and possibility. What's in the future? I'm so excited. I want to hear what, yeah. <laughs> what the future holds for Arit. <laughs> oh, for I, I'm in such a wonderful, expectant place. I'm getting into I, um, some documentaries. I'm pre-producing my first personal documentary that I'm executive producing. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about that. Um, <laughs> so then hopefully coming out sometime i told myself i must do these three things before my 40th birthday next year and i'm saying it here so that i can be held accountable i th those are the things that are that are i'm looking forward to I'm, I'm looking forward to telling more stories um and so many different stories um telling lgbt stories Mm -hmm. or I'm telling women's stories, telling, I'm fascinated by these things we call ordinary stories, because in my experience, it has been the ordinary moments that many times have later on been that strong. Yes, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by those stories. I'm, I'm excited about talking about how our culture influences how we interact with, with certain things. So many, many more stories in many different ways, being more comfortable with my voice mm -hmm. and all the various ways that I can express it. I'm right. trusting my learning and all the different ways that manifest, trusting my journey mm -hmm. and um, enjoying staying in my lane. If there's any one thing um, from this conversation, um, if somebody was just to listen to the last two minutes of it, um, what would you want people or someone listening to remember from this interview? Um, I want anybody listening to remember that Africa is not a monolith. Um, there's such a diversity of stories and experiences and everybody's story is valid. I am passionate about everybody who takes ownership of their story. And whether that story is a story shared or a story lived, uh, your story is valid. I am challenged by the experiences of women on the continent. I'm very burdened by the challenges. And I'm committed in the work that I do 
in witnessing, in addressing, in challenging, you know, those issues. And I think that if we all commit to changing the world around us, mm. we can create ripples far bigger than we imagine. Right. And uh, finally, that a big theme for me as an individual is the authenticity of my existence. Um, that I am a woman who's learning and unlearning and who is finding so much value in being the truth of who I am. Mm -hmm. And so for women who are watching um, this, this channel, these stories are for boss women. I think that a big aspect of bosshood is owning yourself. Um, is identifying the ways that society might challenge you to conform or to bend or to hide, but owning yourself. And like that, um, that quote we all say does so, says so beautifully that when we shine our light, we give others permission to do the same. And you have no idea who's watching you and thinking, gosh, she's such a boss, boss babe. I want to be just like her. You know, she's fierce. She's not afraid to, to put her foot down, to say no, you know. We are all necessary.